So we're back in the series called Self Talk, which is a, for the next couple of months, we're borrowing from Aaron Beck's theory of cognitive behavior therapy and tackling 16 distortions, cognitive distortions, maladaptive behaviors, and uh, 18 schemas, which uh, has many different variations of different schemes and lenses in which we look through the world that affects, most importantly, our relationships. And it's called self-talk because what we say to ourselves when we're by ourselves and what we say about others and what we say about the world, often when we're alone, these automatic thoughts, mostly negative, impact not only our lives, but the most closest relationships that we want to build in our lives and also the way we contribute to the world as global citizens um, and as people living in a globalized city in New York and other places, how we, you know, day to day live out our lives either through, you know, the lens of dread and depression and anxiety, which is prevalent in our culture today. And we, we've gone over so many studies of depression and anxiety, right? In fact, um, we said that over 100 million people are, are on some type of antidepressant in the United States. It's one-third of America. While a bunch of millennials are in counseling, one out of four are diagnosed with some type of mental disorder, the most prevalent being anxiety and depression. Um, most people feel, we said, disconnected than ever before and lonely. And so when we tackle this distortion, um, people have come to me in the last couple of weeks and said, I hope this series never stops. I hope you're on this series until like 2020. And I was like, you like it that much? Yes. It's my favorite series by, by, by far. I'm like, well, I never heard that before. <laughs> Usually when we're on series, I remember preaching through, uh, trying to preach through the Bible in the few, first few years of our church. We got through Leviticus and we had to stop somewhere. But, uh, um, but some people have come to me and said, this is life changing for me. Some of those distortions I never thought about, but I have them. Yes, that's why we're going over it. And it helped me see through a new lens of, of, of people uh, that I didn't speak to. It, it helped me resolve certain things, helped me see the world and myself and others in a, through a different lens. That's great. That's what we want to happen. And so I'm encouraged that you're taking care of this because, you know, CBT is what most counselors use today, most used form of psychotherapy. And why it's effective is because it's self care. Tell someone next to you self care. You know what self-care? Self-care is empowering yourself and learning tools to think through all the emotions and all the negative thoughts, automatic thoughts we have, and learn to live a more congruent life, more peaceful life. And of course, you can do that on your own. And then this series talks about, what, three things. We talked about the distortion. We talked about the reality. And then we talk about why the gospel is the greatest news in the world. Right, amen? So let's, let's tackle... I don't know what number this is. This is like, I don't know, 12 or something. We're gonna, today we're going to tackle uh, catastrophe, a form of thinking, magnifying the negatives and then minimizing the positives. Or actually magnifying failure without nuance and then minimizing improvement. Because in this sort of uh, bipolar form of thinking, Either it's perfect or it, what? It, it's what? It's imperfect. It's a failure. It's a win or a loss. There's no nuance behind it. Um, and as we go through this distortion, I think what, one of the things that will help us sort of uh, illuminate in our lives is some of the language we use in our minds that brings uh, incredible crippling depression sometimes because feelings, they're like the black hole. There's no end. And these emotive, crippling anxiety that we feel throughout the day, a lot of times is irrational. Because let me tell you right now, my six-year-old son experienced this type of magnification, um, hyperbolic, hyperbolic hunger every three, four hours. 
um, my six-year-old son um, will eat, especially during the Thanksgiving break, he would eat, uh, you know, a pork bun. He, that's his favorite food. I don't know why. He's not Chinese, but he thinks he is. I don't know. He hates pork bun. Um, an hour later, he'll, he'll start um, throwing himself on the floor of the, of the carpet of our house with crocodile tears. That's why I don't trust his tears anymore. And he'll say, I am dying of hunger. If he could have, if, if he took like SAT courses, he would use different form, different languages. Like this is child abuse. This is violation of children's rights. Um, this is, this is your horrific parents. I am starving to death. And I go, Josh, you are not starving. He goes, yes, I am. Because if you were starving to death, you'd be dead. But I saw, I saw your belly is full. It's popping out right now. You know, I mean, you're, we just fed you, but I'm so hungry. And so, so the feeling, and let's examine the psychology behind my son's hunger. And we laugh at that. It goes, how ridiculous. But this is what a six-year-old does, and, and we forgive him, and we think it's cute sometimes. Well, not really anymore. But, I mean... We think it's cute, but for a lot of us in this room, we do this in our lives. The story we find ourselves in many different things. You throw a tantrum and you, how, how the world is ending, how this is a disaster. How this is the worst day of your life. This is the worst moment of your life. You have, I, I remember a, a, a friend of mine had a real bad date once. He forgot his credit card and wallet to the first date. Is that bad, ladies? I don't know. Never happened to me before, so. Um, but he said, dude, he goes, my life is over. I'm like, your life is not over. You're still rich. He goes, it's, because he was rich, and, and you're still rich. And he's like, yeah, but I'm never, no one's ever going to go out with me again, and I'm never going to get married. <coughs> I'm never going to have kids. And he, and he went on, um, a, a, you know, a venting session about how he's a loser, he goes, what guy forgets his wallet on a date? Because you're the first one I ever met that did that. But, but is that true? That's a magnifying forgetfulness. No, it's just one date. And if she didn't like you, she didn't like you, not because you forgot you. Well, that's kind of bad. But, I mean, she didn't, she didn't like you because of the way you're acting, how you, what, magnified this mistake as, what, your identity. You could have paid her back. Did you pay her back? That would determine if you get a second date. And if she doesn't, there's always a place called Tiffany's. Right? Go there. I mean, so, so what happens is this, this dis distortion of thinking very hyperbolically about the negatives and minimizing the positives. Right? I mean, I could have said to him, hey, at least you went on a date. You didn't go on a date for like a few years. That's, that's an improvement. He goes, yeah, but whatever. I messed it up. And so, so this time of extremity and, and this distortion, the way we think through certain things, what? It's very, very prevalent in our lives in normal situations, especially if you're going through a tough time in your life. So let's look at this distortion based on Matthew chapter 14. Um, this is the distortion that we're going to tackle today. Read it with me. Yeah, exactly. Catastrophizing views, outcomes as what? Even when what? They're good. So it magnifies shortcomings and it minimizes improvement. So there is no nuance. There's no room for, for growth, really. It's just all or nothing. And um, everything is a horrific event. You know, you, I remember some med students taking their step once and said, this is the most important test of my life. And it was. And, and they feel like it could be a catastrophe because it would determine what specialty they'll go into. Um, or someone studying for the MCAT, or someone studying for the, the LSAT, or someone for the GMAT, for MBA. You know, these moments come where everything about your life seems like it it's, comes to this moment, and how you do, how you perform at this event will determine everything. 
And so it what? It, it definitely maximizes the shortcomings and what? Minimizes improvement. Because if you want to get better at something, how do you get better at it? Is anyone here ever, was, you were just born awesome? This is how some people like to walk into a restaurant or a school. Like you were just born, like your hair wasn't gelled that way, you know, or you didn't go to a salon for five, you know, it takes eight hours for really good hair, and it costs $300. I mean, you, just, you were just born awesome. There's no such thing in humanity as awesome apart from the distance between the goal and what? Improvement and progress and failure. So when you look at this passage, I think it's very important to know that the writers of the New Testament, especially the super apostle, Apostle Peter, uh, records in history how he, a giant of faith, considered you know, by the Catholic Church to be the founder of Christianity with Jesus, shows catastrophic almost type of failure. You could look it through that lens, and maybe he, he did, or you could see it as what? What, what it means to be human and have faith, okay? So let's, let's read it together here. Uh, so, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Jesus is walking on the water, don't be afraid. And that's, you know, kind of messed up because anyone walking on the water is scary. But Lord, if, if and, it, and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water and came toward Jesus. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and what? Came toward Jesus. He walked on water. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And what? Began to what? Sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Now, we look at this story and, and can think through certain things and be like, well, was Jesus upset that he doubted? Because I remember um, when I was teaching, preaching and communications from the undergrad level all the way to the doctorate level, I remember a student preaching this exact passage and looked at us, all 15 of us in the class, looked at us dead in the eye, and then he... he, he went into a monologue where he was Jesus and said, Peter, why did you doubt? <clears throat> How could you doubt me? How could you betray me? Now, this is not in the text. This is Jesus, okay? And, and he looked at us and said, you saw me resurrect Lazarus from the dead. You saw me feed the 5,000. <clears throat> How could you doubt? Why did you doubt me? I said right there, that's a prophet. I got up. I said, shut up, man. Sit down. You failed the sermon. He goes, what? I said, first of all, this is not good preaching, not because of anything else, but because this is not who God is. You're preaching heresy. He was like, my life is over. No, I said, no, dude, your sermon just sucked. Your life is not over. I mean, I, I, I've been um, found out in these classes to be ruthless sometimes, but I mean, I, I'm trying to prepare them for real life, you know, when they go out and people are really struggling, and then you tell them, why'd you doubt? <laughs> Imagine someone struggling in doubt in their lives, in their jobs, in their marriages, feel like they're sinking, and then Jesus is saying, why did you doubt? I died for you. That's precisely the problem we have most of the time. And I said, I want you to rewrite this again, because... The way you're seeing Peter and the way you probably see your life, the schema, the lens you see in your life, is that it, everything is perfect or a disaster. And that's not how life works. Life is not divorced from ambiguity. It cannot be divorced from the messiness that we call life. And that's the problem with this distortion. You see, the distortion really messes up how things play out in real life. Like, like, for example, I told you that I was an idealist, you know, boys to men in the 90s and, you know, all the romantic music and Casey and Jojo, you know. I grew up listening to this music believing that romance is supposed to be like that. And so in college, in Valentine's Day, 
you know, I saved up money and hired a chef. Well, one of the college students in my school. <laughs> I hired a driver, which is another friend. And then we did this Italian dinner with lobster, right? And, you know, I'm thinking, hey, this is awesome. Look how romantic I am. You know, my wife was like, what is this for? Why are you making such a big deal? I'm like, man, this is not a good evening. <laughs> Our relationship is doomed. Why? Because I'm looking at, I'm trying to create the most idealistic, what, world <laughs> Valentine's Day should be. But there's no book for that. There's no perfect world where this exists. It only exists in your mind. And, and I was disappointed, but I began to realize as I dated, as I got married, as I had kids, there was no such thing as that type of romance where you turn on boys to men and start dancing and everything is perfect, you, you know? Um, it doesn't work that way. And so what, was that a, a catastrophe? I thought it at that moment, 21 years old, I thought it was. I look back now, and what, what, what does it look like? It was just an assumption that I had. I actually opposed on my wife, or then girlfriend. So you, this distortion ruins relationships because we see everything as a red flag. We begin to, what, fatalize everything. Everything is fatalistic. So what's the reality then? If this is a distortion, read we most. What's the reality? If what? If the goal is to be measurable, then what? Growth is what? Somewhere between what? And success. So if if a goal is to be measurable, so how do you know? This is the thing that uh, that drives me insane about church. You're like, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to love the church, but it drives me insane. The people in the church. Not you guys, no, most of you guys. And I mean, it, it drives me insane. Why, why does it drive me insane? Because people talk about spiritual growth in the spiritual life, in the seminary, in spiritual books, like it's the goal, but no one can define how you can measure it. See, I'm also a researcher, and, and me, I don't do things without evidence. I like to quantify things. I've quantified my marriage based on certain measurements, all right? That's just the way I am. So in the spiritual life or in regular life, if there is no goal, if there is no way to what, measure it, then how do you know where you really are? You don't. And so in reality is, if a goal is to be measurable, growth is inevitable, somewhere between failure and success. So that means that failure is what? Inevitable. Because you're not going to do anything perfect in the first time. Because that's impossible. So it says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and what? Came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried, Lord, save me. Now, this is a powerful testament to Christianity. Why? Because you see a hero of the church struggling. How many people here struggle in their faith sometimes? Raise your hand if you struggle with your faith. You know what I'm saying? Okay, be, be real. You know what I'm <laughs> I mean, if, if we had to be perfect, and there was no measurement, there was no incremental way to move toward Jesus, then we would all be doomed, and Christianity wouldn't be a foundation on grace. It would be a foundation on what? Works. It would be more suffocating than the world puts on us now, the expectations that we have even on ourselves. Yeah? So the question I have for you today is this. When you look into your life, 
How do you see yourself and others? Is there nuance? Whatever situation you might be in your life today, how do you grow? Do you tell yourself these, these words, hey, I, I'm a loser because, or the word, I'm never going to get out of this place in my life. I'm never going to get there in my life because of what I feel right now, what I'm going through right now. Because that's where people get stuck. How many people ever feel like you're, when you're in traffic? How many people here hate traffic? I mean, Lord. Traffic is, I, I call it catastrophic. That's not catastrophizing anything. When you're in traffic in L.A., like, it's like, Lord, why, why, why was I born? You know like, why, why, why'd you make me? And, um, but, but the reason why people hate traffic so much is not because literally of, of the physical um, place that you're stuck. What it highlights and illuminates internally is, emotively is, I feel stuck in my life. I feel stuck in my job. I feel stuck in this place. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to get out of it. And I'm, or I feel already delayed. I'm already late to this thing I'm going to. I already feel like I'm late getting married, I'm getting this job I need or this career I want. I'm already delayed. How much do, I'm just going to miss it. So the, so the physical barrier is not what we're frustrated about. And why people have road rage is not because they're, they're evil. They feel stuck and behind. How many of you feel like that sometimes? Stuck and behind, delayed. That's the reality. The reality is this. It's not that you're a loser or that you're a failure. The reality is simple. Okay, let me just put it this way, okay? Sometimes things are going to work out. Tell someone, sometimes things are going to work out. And sometimes, tell them, they're not. Okay? Sometimes they're going to work out and sometimes they're not. That's called life. You won't always fail, but sometimes you will. Sometimes you win. And then what? Sometimes you learn. Learning is in the middle between failure and success of the goal. I mean, what good news for people who feel stuck than the person of Jesus Christ in this narrative? Who is not condemning us for struggling with anxiety because of our environment, because we feel like our life is on shaky ground. But Jesus went toward Peter right when he was falling in the water. And he saved him. And I don't believe Jesus yelled at Peter. I believe Jesus was laughing. Peter, like, like this. Not like, Peter, why'd you betray me? Like that other guy. I don't know where he is. I pray for him. But, uh, you know, but I, I felt like this is the narrative. Peter, Peter, you know, Peter, Jesus put his hand down. Peter was reaching in. Jesus said, I don't think so. And then lifted up, put it out again. Jesus was kidding. Jesus was laughing. He goes, why'd you doubt and laughing? Because Peter did something no one else in history has ever done. I heard stories from churches that some missionaries walked in the water, but I doubt it. This is the first time someone in human history walked on the water for a couple of seconds. Bro, that is news. And we could look at Peter's, we could look at this moment as a failure, but you could also look at it as an ama amazing moment for human history where someone defiled physics. And that's the truth about us. We're, the complexity of humanity is that we're succeeding and failing all at the same time. I'm succeeding and failing as a father at the same time. How do I know how to be a better father if what? I don't know how to do it. You know, when I was a new father, I got married when I was 23. I was a first time father at 27. One time I left Nathan in the car in his car seat, because I was thirsty, and I got a Diet Coke. <laughs> if the popo came, I would have been arrested, and he would have went to child services. And my wife said, are you crazy? 
I said, I was thirsty, I need a Diet Coke. I never had a moment where I couldn't go to 7-Eleven and get a Diet Coke. Oh, so I'm not supposed to do that. She goes, no. But I left the AC on, I left the car on. <laughs> mm. All the respect I had in this room is gone. <laughs> but, but how do I know how to not to do something if I don't do it? it it's, I, I can't be a perfect father. There's only one perfect father who doesn't need improvement. I, how can I be a better husband? There has to be what? It's, it's somewhere between failure and success. So let's look at the good news of the gospel, lastly. So, the gospel. If you look it through this lens, to Jesus in this narrative, faith is more what? An adventurous what? Journey than what? A life-altering exam. And I think for a lot of us, in our faith and in our life, we see everything through a test. Especially if you're an Asian American, everything is a test. How do I do? I want to be number one. I got to get the best grades. I got to get into the best schools. Everything. Rejection is not an option. And then we come to church, and sometimes the church then says, faith is more works. Faith is another test. You're not praying enough. That's how I used to feel when I was 16. I used to call my mentor. My, mother, my mentor used to tell me, so how are you doing, Sam? I'm not praying enough. I just prayed three hours. But I should be praying more. I should be praying eight hours. I heard this other megachurch pastor was praying eight hours a day, and I need to get there. And he goes, what else, Sam? How are you doing? I'm not reading the Bible enough. I only read two hours a week. Two hours, two, three hours a week. That's not, I heard another pastor, they were reading like 10 hours a week. I need to get there. What else? Oh, well, I'm not leading people to Christ enough. I'm only averaging three people, leading three people to Christ a month, and that's not enough. Billy Graham's been leading millions of people. That's not, I'm, I am falling behind. I'm delayed. I am delayed. I am seriously delayed. What else? I think I could be holier, too. I go to the other track when there are pretty girls on the train, but sometimes I really want to look. I saw Christianity through the lens of a, an exam. Not grace, but works. Greater burden. You see, in this text, the power of the narrative is that Jesus, it says in the text, and if you read it carefully, the scheme of Jesus, the scheme of God in this, in this narrative is very simple. He purposely set this situation up for revelation. He purposely dis he, what he, what he disrupted, interrupted the normal, the normalcy of their lives, especially Peter and the disciples, to try to form in them something very special. Because our relationship with God is more a journey than it is what? An exam. If you look at it as an exam, then you're never going to be doing enough for God. You're not going to a small group enough. You're not coming to church enough. You're not praying enough. If you're looking through that lens, you're going to fail all the time. But if it's a journey, then you're jet skiing with Jesus. You're going to fall. You're going to get back on. You get, you try to do some flips. Try to do some tricks. You're going to look like an idiot sometimes. You're gonna, fall up, you're gonna fall off the jet ski. But you, it's fine, you could swim. You get back on. It's about the memories you create, it's about the altars you create. It is not about how well you do something. It's about what? Jesus being with you on the journey. That's the power of the gospel, folks. It's not a destination, more than it's a relationship. Here, the power, one of the most powerful stories of the New Testament is that Jesus walked on water with Peter. And Peter will boast. When we get there, we will, Peter will boast forever, I'm the water walker. None of you guys walked on water. I'm the only one that did in human history. If you look at it through that lens, what an adventure. 
And I guarantee you, some of you in this room will water walk as well. Maybe not on physical. Don't try. Don't go to the Hudson. Don't get out there. It goes, I believe. Don't, please. I don't, I don't want to see in the newspaper someone that's died. And then said, this pastor, this minister in the city said you could walk on water and you die. Please don't. Don't take it literally. I'm talking about different spheres in your life, different areas in your life where you, you think you're sinking, but you can, what, break through, transcend it, glide through it through the power of the gospel. Amen? Stand and pray together. If you're a Christian and you're not getting wet, there's a problem. All those 11 disciples didn't get out of the water because they didn't think they could. They thought that was crazy. But Christianity is an invitation to water ski with Jesus. Whether you fall or not, Jesus will be there to save you. And I want to pray today that you would go upon the water as he's calling you whatever that might be in your life. And that would be a testimony of God's miracle power in your life to those around you. Let's make this our prayer. So capsize me Let me drown in your mighty rivers And I will let go Trust that you will lead me to where you are. So capsize me, let me drown in your mighty rivers. I will let go of my sails and trust that you. that I will stay afloat even though the wind frightens me and I will step out of this boat to meet you on the surface of the sea I will trust that I will stay afloat even though the into me so capsize me let me drown in your mighty rivers and I will let go of my sails and trust that you Father, we want to come before you this afternoon. With the places we feel like we're stuck. But we don't leave room for nuance. For growth. See, the goal is not for you to please Jesus or God and to just do things. Pray and read the Bible and go to church as activities, as some type of checklist or feeling guilty because I don't do them. No, Jesus is inviting you to a journey with him. And he's trying to take you on these amazing valleys, amazing mountain climbing experiences, jet skiing, 
whatever you like to do. I mean, no one, like, I don't do mountain climbing because it's just too, too, too tiring, you know? I don't know why people do that, but some people do it. I mean, no one climbs a, a mountain to do it perfectly or, or because they're taking an exam. They do it because they want to see the beauty and the people they're doing it with. There's a relationship and intimacy that forms when you climb mountains and look at rivers. I mean, if we saw our relationship with God this way, it would really eliminate a lot of the guilt we feel. Because a lot of times, a lot of Christians, I'm sorry, I'm going to be bluntly honest, like I was to, to my student in my preaching class. Jesus thinks a lot of you are boring. Like, why, why do you think that way? Look what I'm inviting you to. I want to journey with you. I want to take you to places you've never seen. I want to stretch you to the limit, let you see the very imago Dei, very glory that I put in you to stretch you, the best of you can be seen. So you will know for yourself the masterpiece I've created and the masterful story I'm writing in your life. And you know, the only response when, when Jesus journeys with us, at every moment that's difficult, every moment when he needs to save us, is when they went back on the boat, they worshipped him. Worship through the lens of fire and storm. Worship through mountains and rivers. Worship through that type of beauty, seeing the beauty of Jesus, is worship that will change your life. And that's worship that changed the disciples' life. And I pray that you would worship, not just here, but you would worship from the mountaintop, from the desert, from the rivers, from the mountains that your relationship with God would become so real and organic that worship would come from the heart. And this is where I've always belonged. And this is where, 
And this is where I'm safe And this is where I'm sound And this is where I've always belonged I swim through your currents I sink into your waves Submerge in your love I breathe under eternal blue And dive in oceanic you Submerge in your love and this is where I'm safe, and this is where I'm sound, and this is where I've always belonged. I swim through your currents, I sink into your waves, submerge in your love. I breathe under eternal blue and dive in oceanic you. Submerge in your love, submerge in your love. So, Father, we come before you this afternoon. No matter how dangerous or catastrophic, no matter how stressful, no matter how great the danger it seems in our life in the middle of the storm, this is the place we're safe. This is a place for sound. This is a place we belong if we're with you. That's the point. The point is to do it with Jesus. Not to just do it. Because that's just stupid, right? It's like eating alone. That's sad. Christianity is not just about praying because you have to pray. It's about reading the Bible. No, it's about relationship. This narrative was about the relationship Jesus had with Peter. An amazing journey. Depiction. Biopic of a faith and doubt and triumph. Improvement, growth. And Jesus is calling you today. I pray you say yes. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. All God's people pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.